Yo, what's up builders? Just last week after three months of building, I finally shipped my creator economy SaaS. Throughout that process, AI has been a core part of my daily programming workflow, and Cursor is the editor that I write my front-end applications in. Now, a lot of people on YouTube will hype up tools like this, and while they are getting really powerful, and definitely have saved me a lot of time, I want to show you how I actually use these tools, and more importantly, what their drawbacks still are. I don't think that coding is dead or you shouldn't bother learning it because you can just prompt cursor, but as you're learning skills and hopefully building cool shit with them, I hope this video helps you to be a bit more productive. So I've been using cursor for about 10 months now, and I initially just tried it out out of curiosity because I'd used VS Code for years and thought Copilot was a cool idea. I quickly fell in love with the tab completions and Command K because it felt like the perfect use case of AI, which was quickly asking it to make quick fixes or just auto-completing my lines as I was going through the code. With these two features, I know what I'm trying to write, so it really just speeds me up and keeps me in flow as I'm coding. For my startup creator Kiwi, the stack is a Next.js app for the front-end dashboard and the marketing site, with a Golang backend that hooks into the Postgres database, Redis cache, and a couple of other things. I actually use Golang whenever I'm writing my backends because I love the JetBrains editors, and the debugger is really nice. Also, things like jumping around to method definitions or the built-in Go linter works much better, at least out of the box. That said, I use Cursor for everything else when I'm writing TypeScript code, and I've really enjoyed it. Recently, the biggest thing that's changed about my Cursor workflow is I've used the chat window a lot more than I ever did. For most of my time with Cursor, I simply use the tab autocompletes and command K. Everything else in terms of talking with AI, I would go to the Claude web app and copy and paste any code I got from there, but my use case for the most part with AI is not actually having it write everything, it's more to ask it how I can approach something technically and have it help me name a database column or table so that it's simple but makes sense, etc, etc. The ask mode in the cursor chat is perfect for things like this because it has context of your entire code base. It won't always remember whether I've already set up a database table or started work on a new component, so I will usually reference the files or even the specific app I'm talking about whenever prompting. In Cursor, you can type the at symbol, and this lets you reference files or folders in your project. Because the Creator QB codebase is set up as a monorepo, I have an apps directory in which there's a bunch of different projects for my front end, back end, link direct service, and a multi-tenant app. Working with Cursor while I was building this was great because because I could add the links project and ask it a question in that context, while also linking my API and explain how I was thinking about connecting the two. You can also mention external websites or documentation to ask questions without having to necessarily leave your editor. I find this most useful to get quick answers about whether something is possible, reminding myself what some endpoint is, or getting a specific reference where I can then go and look at it myself. Cursor is building a ton of stuff with the agent mode at the moment, and I will get into how I'm using that, but honestly, there's just something about using only the ask mode that I kind of vibe with. I saw a tweet the other day from the Selene founder, which is the web analytics tool I'm using at the moment, and he said that using ask mode to stay in control of your code and feel like you're guiding the AI, not the other way around, is the best way to use these tools while engineering a great product. I've been thinking a lot about that and so I've really tried to ask better questions to Cursor and not simply have it try to think for me because I think that's where you start to get the shitty output that you have to revert. This also forces you to read any code it suggests and quickly realize when it makes a mistake or even just does something you don't really want it to do. There's been way too many times that I realized way after I initially accepted a solution that Cursor fucked something up. Now, while you're building out your apps, taking the time to plan at a higher level in the moment feels like a slog and a waste of time, but it really helps you move faster in the long run. I think one of the reasons I managed to ship Creator Kiwi last week week and not in another three months was I really got clear on what my MVP looked like and didn't let feature creep get to me. One of the main ways I accomplished this was using linear to plan tasks and being more disciplined with Git, going on separate branches for specific features or bug fixes, and having a proper PR workflow. GitLens, who is sponsoring this video, is a tool that I've used for years, but they've been working on some super cool things with their extension that makes it especially helpful as you're shipping apps. If you're using VS Code, Curse, or WinSurf or any other VS Code based editor, you can add GitLens and immediately start to get a better visualization into your project. I first started using GitLens for their inline Git blames that showed me when a line was last changed.
changed, the specific commit it's related to, and that message. If a commit was a few weeks or months ago and I forgot what the exact context of the change was, you can ask AI to explain what those changes were. This will open a new window where you can get a concise summary of the impact this commit had on each file. Often it's helpful to view the entire commit and GitLens lets you do this without having to jump to GitHub. From the three dot menu, I can inspect the commit details and see each of the changed files in my sidebar. From here, I can jump to see this commit in my commit graph, which shows the sequence of commits in your repository across all branches by default. This at a glance shows you the progress you and your team are making. You can easily see the changes made on your main branch and when sub branches were eventually merged in. Within the graph, you can search for specific commits or simply describe the one you're looking for in natural language. It's also useful to view over time how many lines of code you're adding and removing, so you can click on visual history to see a chart over time of your various commits and hover to get context. You can also view the same visual history on a file level through the sidebar. When you're committing new changes, one of the hardest things can be writing a commit message that properly summarizes what the actual impact was. GitLens lets you use AI to generate these messages super fast. You can also use GitLens to generate PR descriptions so that you can focus on just writing the code. With the power of AI, GitLens becomes a great way to quickly get an overview of your entire development workflow. The home view shows your currently open PRs and helps you to get unblocked. You can get started with GitLens Pro for free by heading to the first link in the description and then upgrade with 50% off your first pro seat. Now, when working through PRs, I've been testing out a ton of different AI code review tools and CodeRabbit, who I've worked with on the channel, is one, along with Cursor having now built their own code review tool, which is very interesting. It works much like you'd want it to, but it does a great job at finding weird edge cases in your code and can optionally open up within Cursor to automatically resolve the error. A lot of times I ignore what it has to say because I don't care or it's being a little too picky, but there have been many times where there's a serious bug that I completely overlooked and it was able to catch it for me. Bugbot is still in beta and right now it's free to use, so I have it run on every one of my PRs. Now, Agent Mode and Cursor is getting a lot better, so it still does make its way into my workflow. The most recent advancement Cursor has made is with background agents. This lets you run an agent in Cursor to go and complete some task, but instead of being on your own machine, it's running in the cloud. This will create a new branch that you can later review as a PR and merge it in. I've experimented with these background agents and honestly, I've probably just given it too vague of instructions, but so far I've not used any of the code from these. I do think the coolest use case is spinning up a background agent from Slack or the web interface when you're away from your computer and want to fix a quick bug or add some small feature. Agent mode within the sidebar is what I use most often and for me there are some cases like refactoring a bunch of TypeScript into separate components or copying my ghost structs from my API into TypeScript interfaces where something like the agent is super nice. I have noticed recently that the agent is taking a lot more time to plan what it's going to do and doesn't automatically get into generating code. It'll often come back to me and ask questions or clarify which approach I want to go with before attempting to solve the problem. Prototyping UIs is another good use case for the agent. Specifically, as my app grows in size, there's more inspiration and examples of my design system that the agent can base it off of. I use Mobbin and Nicely Done as design inspiration tools, and so grabbing a screenshot as reference and providing it to Cursor is a great way to quickly test out new interfaces in my apps. When I'm using agent, if it's currently generating an answer, but I think of the next thing I want to ask it. Somewhat recently, you've had the ability to queue up new messages that the agent will handle when it's ready. Now, as Cursor is generating code, you want to make sure that its output is as high quality and consistent as possible. For me, I define that as the code stays as concise and easy to understand while following my style of coding. Cursor rules are very helpful for this, and they've gotten a lot more advanced recently. Previously, you simply added a .cursor rules file, and it acted as essentially a system prompt that would be provided to every cursor call. The newer way of providing context to cursor is still in a cursor rules directory, but you create new files ending in .mdc, which is specific to cursor. This allows you to write a prompt that will only be applied in certain situations. For example, you can say the rule is always applied in chats and command K sessions, only when you specifically mention it, or when the file you're working with matches a specific pattern, e.g. .tsx or 
cursor.go. If you want it to be a little more nuanced, you can write a rule and describe to cursor when it should be applied. For example, you might make a rule about replicating UI designs and say, when I give you a screenshot and I'm building an interface, use this rule. I've been using a couple of different cursor rules over the last few months, and while I do think that it's improved the output, it's honestly not something that I would obsess over if you aren't already using them. I would maybe just recommend writing a couple about your coding style and project structure, and then you've got the 80-20. If you're interested in seeing the cursor rules I use, along with some tools that have helped me to ship my first SaaS, I'll have a link in the description where you can get that list for free. One of the things that I've always liked about VS Code is how much you can customize it. I switch up my theme all the time, and especially recently, I've been jumping through many different themes. Currently, I'm using Owlet Charcoal, but I've also liked Cappuccino Mocha and Vesper. My file icon theme is Symbol Icons, which gives my folders and files a super clean look. For errors in the editor, I have Error Lens, which will highlight each lens when there's a lincher error, so that's very easy to see. I use the NeoVim extension to have NeoVim bindings, and then the line number deco for relative line numbers. So that's how I'm using Cursor as I'm writing code for my startup. If you're a creator yourself who's struggling to understand how how your videos are leading to leads and revenue for your business, I'll leave a link in the description where you can schedule a time with me and I'll show you around the platform of Creator Kiwi and understand how to make it valuable for you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.